Hey, welcome back to The Dive. Our guest today is going to deep dive into copper. He will share his thoughts on copper's role in renewable energy, copper's price action, supply and demand, as well as the company's overview, projects, exploration, most recent drill program results, and key metrics investors should know over the near term. He's the president and CEO of Stone Gold. John Timmons is joining us today. Hey, John, welcome to The Dive. Thanks, Cassandra, and thank you for your time and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Yeah, thanks so much for jumping on with us today. Okay, so let's start out talking about copper. Some commodity analysts say that copper might be one of the tightest commodity markets that we've ever seen in history. Do you agree with the sentiment? I think it'd be difficult to argue. Um, you know, much demand or much focus has been this green energy shift. However, traditional copper uses are still a major factor in this market. You know, for example, India is about a 3% um, penetration for air conditioners, and that's expected to rise significantly. And over the next couple of years, there's you know enough projects turning on. Ivanhoe's project in the DRC, Angles Kelly Vehicle in Peru, a Grassberg expansion. Uh, I think we'd support that 22 to 23 million ton range. However, this you know increased potential over the next five years up to you know 30 million tons. I think it'll be very difficult to achieve with uh, with current production. I read a recent article regarding the grid upgrade in the U.S. alone to get a two trillion dollar upgrade. And that would require a significant amount of copper. So I fully agree with that sentiment. Okay, so you mentioned green energy. How do you see copper evolving um, as the world shifts towards green energy? Well, you know, much focus is really on this EV market. Um, and I think some respects, the green market in general regarding turbines and solar panels, the power transfer, and this is on, you know, truly a global scale. Um, copper is very important here. You know, it's a great conductor. It doesn't deteriorate. Um, you know, a lot of countries don't have their own supply, so that puts increased demand on it. And, you know, with grades decreasing, um, you know, uh, copper is going to become a very important commodity here. Okay, so one thing that we've been seeing recently with certain commodities is that manufacturers are securing their own supply of raw materials from producers instead of spot markets. Do you think that we could see this happen with copper? Indeed, and I, I think a, a lot of companies and countries would be following the lead of you know, some of these Japanese companies like Mitsubishi, um, who's taken off take agreements in copper and lithium and directly getting involved in equity ownership in Copper Mountain and Escondida. So, you know, uh, definitely um, you see te Tesla too with, with nickel from Tamarack, um, that Talon Rio or our joint venture in, in uh, Northern Michigan, um, lithium from Lion Town in Australia. And I think, you know, industrials and company or countries both will be aggressively pursuing offtake agreements, if not getting involved more in actual buying ownership of these mines. Now, some say that demand for copper may rise this year, but still be lower than supply. What does the supply outlook look like for the existing set of copper mines that are in production already? Uh, you know, I think for the next couple of years, I'm seeing numbers as 22 to 23 million dollar range. Um, with some of these newer, bigger mines coming online, you know, I think we, we sort of meet that demand for the next couple of years. But looking out five, six years, it's increased to 30 million tons a year. Um, you know, I think that's going to be difficult to meet here with, with the current production scenarios. So let's talk about Stone Gold. Could you walk us through the high level story for Stone Gold? Certainly. We're exploring for copper for Canadians at the Copper Road Project, which is about 80K north of Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, we have excellent site access close to Trans-Canada, logging roads throughout the site. Uh, the Copper Road project itself is about a 19,000 hectare northeast trending copper system inclusive of two past producers. Uh, the Copper Corp mine was run by Sheridan Geophysics from approximately 66 to 72, and the former Tribag mine from Tech Resource in the same time area. Uh, we're in the middle of a 4,000 meter drill program at the former Tribag mine zone looking to establish near surface tonnage and grade while exploring for a major copper system of depth. Okay, so the Botswana Bay District had limited exploration since the 1970s. How likely is it that it's going to have the potential to deliver a sizable copper deposit? Well, I think the term underexplored is well used in this industry. I think it's particularly relevant in this case due to both mines being close to staking for 30, 40 years respectively. 
uh, fragmented land ownership. The district has never been consolidated, nor in my opinion, systematically explored. Because Keweenaw Peninsula in Northern Michigan was mined for high grade copper for over hundred years. We have the same Keweenaw type mineralization of copper robes, the eastern extension of the mid-continental rift. You know, those Lake Superior regions delivered some infamous deposits in the gold side of Hemlo, um, you know, Lactazil, Platinum, Palladium, uh, even to the Lundin's uh, Eagle Mine, which is just about 100K south of us, a high grade copper nickel mine. Um, there's a number of a cluster of breccia pipes in the tri-bag zone that contain near surface mineralization and historical estimates. And we believe we can drill current and add additional near surface targets to build tonnage and grade while exploring for a larger intrusive copper deposit of depth. Okay, so you are um, going to explore other regions of the property as well? Indeed, there's three main zones across the property, uh, the Copper Corp zone, the former Tribag zone, and the, the Joggin Porphyry and Richards Breccia in the, in the middle of this. And this returned exceptional grades from 90s of, uh, of the 1990s of 27 meters of 1.5% copper uh, plus a gold credit. So that's another area we'd like to uh, undertake here, whether it's the fall or next spring, but uh, it's a big project. Uh, we have lots of targets. We have a very good geological team and, you know, we're looking to, you know, really advance this project quickly. Okay, so lastly, what are some of the key metrics that investors should look out for with Stone Gold over the near term? Well, as I said, we have an ongoing 4,000 meter drill program right now. We're expecting, you know, drill results from now until into the, into the fall. And we'd look to leverage those drill results into additional capital injections into the company to undertake a large and a regional exploration program, um, developing current targets and new targets. Uh, Top-notch geological team, which I worked with in Guyana Goldfields for many years, and they were integral in discovering the 8 million ounce Aurora gold mine. Um, you know, early days in this project, um, we're very excited. It's a big district, well mineralized, and we're looking to add significant value for shareholders over the next year. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story with us, John. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for tuning in today. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so we can keep bringing you these videos.